Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. So welcome to Convocation. I appreciate you being here. I know that some people's lives are a little more complicated. Uh, with the rain, I had a student this morning let me know that kind of both sides of the road were flooded in. So uh, we want to be mindful of those. And in a minute, we will take a moment and pray for those affected. But this morning, uh, I'm excited. We have a special guest with us, our Convocation speaker today. Is Bishop John Stowe, and he is here uh, with the Catholic Church. Uh, he is the bishop in Lexington, and he's going to come talk to us. You're going to notice in front of you is a long description of his bio, and he was appointed the bishop in 2015. Uh, before that, he uh, was a pastor priest in Texas, uh, and he's also now the presiding Episcopal president of uh, Pax Christi. You, uh, that's a large Catholic peace organization doing some really incredible work in our world. So I also want to say a special thanks to Father Rob Adams if he would wave for us. I know he loves to be right here in the center of public. But anyway, uh, Father Rob is the local Catholic priest. Uh, every Wednesday at noon in our chapel, we have Mass. I don't know if you know this. It's kind of an abbreviated service, but it's a half hour. Uh, you can come have Mass celebrate Mass, but also then still get lunch before your 1 o'clock hour. And it's a great way to focus and center yourselves all week long. So if you are here today for, uh, I mean, God has laid it on your heart, and maybe a professor is also motivated by credit, and those two great mystical forces together. If so, afterwards you would see me so you can sign an attendance sheet. But I know for many of you, this 11 o'clock hour is pretty serious space have to miss lunch, and because of that, I want to offer the best I can give you, which are Pop-Tarts and random snacks up there, so afterwards, make sure you load up your book bag and a few of those things. So, before Bishop John comes, let's take a moment and pray for those who are currently impacted by all this flooding here in Eastern Kentucky. Let's take a moment and pray. Lord God, I thank you that you are good, and everything you do is good. But today, for our brothers and sisters in Harlan, Williamsburg, in our own community, who are now trying to mop up, clean up, move things because of the rain. We ask the Lord a special grace on them. We also ask the Lord that He would call to mind names and situations to empower us to help physically in those issues. So today, Lord, thank you for hearing us. Thank you for our guests. We pray a blessing on His ministry and His leadership. And may you use His voice uh, to proclaim your truth. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Bishop Florgers. Thank you. First of all, let me just say it's wonderful to be here. I'm impressed by the presence of the University of Pikeville. I'm glad for what it contributes to Eastern Kentucky, what it contributes to this community, especially now with the medical school and the school of optometry. It's a great force for renewal in this part of the country. As a Catholic bishop, I'm responsible for 50 counties of Kentucky. Catholics are a small minority of our population. Over those 50 counties, 40 of which are in Appalachia, 10 are in the bluegrass. And across those 50 counties, only 3% of, of the population in general belongs to the Catholic Church. Nonetheless, we understand our faith as one that must bear witness in the public sphere. And we believe we have a very important 2,000 year tradition that we can bear, uh, can bring a lot of insight, a lot of experience, and a lot of help to a variety of situations. And one of the things I'd like to reflect with you and uh, about today is precisely the role of religious witnesses, religious figures, contributing to public policy and the debates over public policy in a pluralistic society. As Catholics, we know what it is to be a minority in this part of the country. If you look at the little biographical form that I had, I spent the first 15 years of my priesthood in El Paso, Texas, on the U.S.-Mexico border, where Catholics are about 90% of the population. So I know what it's like when the church says something and people like pay attention, and I know what it's like when the church says something and people turn the page or turn the channel or ignore it entirely. Nonetheless, I'm convinced we have something to offer and we are interested and eager to be dialogue partners with the larger society, trying to contribute as a force for the common good. So I'm grateful for this opportunity to speak to you this morning, grateful for the invitation to be in this space. 
that has been traditionally given over to some expression of faith in some format. And the, the topic that I was first invited to speak about was the issues of pro-life and the sanctity of human life. And in our Catholic perspective, how that connects across a variety of issues, far more than just the issue of abortion. I'm going to describe an approach to those life issues that was first popularized by a late cardinal of Chicago named Joseph Bernadine, using the image from the passion narratives of Jesus' garment being of one piece and the soldiers not wanting to tear it, but rather casting lots to take the whole thing and not shred it apart. He spoke about our approach to life issues as a seamless garment. And that phrase, seamless garment, has become kind of a shorthand in the Catholic world for a way of talking about the interrelatedness of a variety of life issues, all based on the importance of protecting innocent life and recognizing the sanctity and dignity of all human life. So the phrase was popularized by Cardinal Joseph Bernadine in his time in Chicago, but it was at a time when he had just led the bishops of the United States in writing a pastoral letter about war and peace. In the early 1980s, when the Cold War was still going on, I know that sounds like ancient history to the audience that I'm speaking to now, but this was a time period where there was great tension between the United States and what was the Soviet Union, and the realization that we had the power to mutually destroy each other and the rest of the planet at the same time. We were engaged in, and to a lesser extent, are still engaged in an arms race, but an arms race to build up more and more nuclear weapons that had the potential to destroy the planet many times over. We were concerned about how close to doomsday we were getting, and who was really going to be willing to take the first move, either to dismantle that nuclear force or to use it to destroy and punish the others destroying and punishing themselves and the rest of the world at the same time. So in the early 1980s, the Catholic bishops of the United States wrote a pastoral letter. A pastoral letter is one of the teaching tools that is used in our church. They are broadly, broadly disseminated, and they're a way of taking the scriptures, Old and New Testament, that have been handed on to us, and the wisdom of our 2,000-year tradition, and saying what those things teach us about issues that we're facing today, that weren't faced at the time of the scriptures and that haven't come up before in the tradition. They wanted to talk about the values of protecting innocent human life, the danger of putting the whole world on notice that it could be destroyed imminently, and whether it was moral even to use the amount of resources that were necessary to build up these arsenals of nuclear weapons which at tremendous cost, and then hope that you never have to use them. So the bishops at that time addressed all these issues together in a pastoral letter that ended up being very controversial. Very controversial, sometimes the bishops are called non-patriotic because they didn't believe that the United States should automatically be trusted to do the right thing in every situation, in every circumstance. They were questioned because many people's lives depend on military and the arms race, their livelihoods, their, their income, their employment depended on those things. And they were questioned about whether it was even a religious topic at all to be talking about the issues of nuclear war. Well, Cardinal Bernadine, as he was drafting that letter and putting that together and doing listening sessions across the country as they were teaching from that letter, was struck by the interconnection of a number of issues that are important to us as a church that all come down to the question of protecting innocent life. And so 1983, when that pastoral letter on peace was proposed, it was also the 10th anniversary of the 1973 Supreme Court decision, Roe versus Wade, which legalized abortion on demand throughout the United States and said that it was constitutionally protected. The Catholic Church has never accepted that, that ruling, recognize it as the law of the land, but realize that we have a strong moral obligation to teach our own people why we believe that life begins at the first moment of conception and why the child in a womb, the fetus in a womb, is actually a sacred human life 
and needs to be defended. This is not just an isolated teaching, but it connects to a concern for the vulnerable, a concern for the innocent, a concern for those who cannot take care of themselves. And so the more that Cardinal Bernadine was writing about the, the situation of war and peace, the, the more he saw the connection to the situation of the protection of innocent, vulnerable life in the womb. He was elected to be the chair of the committee of the U.S. Catholic bishops. So the U.S. Catholic bishops is a body of a, about 350 bishops across the country. He was elected to chair the committee of pro-life activities, and so he had many opportunities to be teaching and lobbying and advocating on the issue of the sanctity of human life. It was when he was addressing a university audience at Fordham University, a Jesuit university in New York City, where he coined the phrase, the seamless garment, as a way of talking about the interconnectedness of all these issues that focus on the protection of innocent life and the sanctity of human life. As a pastor and a teacher, Cardinal Bernadine was deliberate in choosing university settings for making these kinds of presentations because he wanted an interchange, he wanted critical thinking about these issues, he wanted to bring in perspectives that weren't always recognized in a more materialist and a more scientifically driven society, but things that could be argued in those fields as well. Naturally, he depended on universities within the Catholic system and particularly in the Jesuit system because he knew he would have an audience and a faculty that could continue to do more research on the very issues that were being presented. The issues could be refined, debated, scrutinized, and then applied to the public policy debate. It arose from the context of that pastoral letter called The Challenge of Peace, questioning the morality of nuclear deterrence, and then again the connection between the protection of innocent life in nuclear war and the protection of innocent life in the womb. Cardinal Bernadine wondered aloud whether Catholics and others who followed our moral teaching on abortion would, re would appreciate seeing the interrelationship of all human life issues and finding a coherent and unified way within a moral framework to bring that into the public sphere and make our advocacy more effective and more productive. Now to even talk about this means that we have to address a larger issue is what is a church's role in public policy? It's not a matter of the church deciding what law should be, but it's a matter of the church having a voice and trying to influence public opinion in a representative form of democracy that we use in this land and making sure that we have a voice among many at the table and insist that we have to defend our way of thinking, not just say things and tell people to believe but to defend, describe, and invite dialogue about these important issues. I also have to acknowledge, not only here, but throughout the United States, that there was a strong historical prejudice against Catholics. It came to the fore when John F. Kennedy ran for president in 1960, and his presidency aroused a lot of suspicion across the country about the nature and role of Catholicism. Many believe that a Catholic owed his first loyalty to the Pope, who is the leader of a foreign country, and so wondered how a Catholic could legitimately be elected to public office in the United States. Now, on the one hand, that was an exaggerated claim that in many cases was born out of prejudice, the prejudice with the idea that Vatican armies would be crossing the sea if he were elected, that the president would be getting secret orders from the Pope and have to carry it out with the US military because Catholicism had been seen as a foreign religion despite its presence in the United States from before colonial days. And it was seen as a, a religion that was imported by immigrants. Our Catholic presence right here at Pikeville and in Pike County was brought in by immigrants who worked in the coal mines, mostly from Eastern and Southern Europe. And so for many of the native people, it was seen as a foreign religion. The fact that our worship happened for many generations in the language, uh, the Latin language, a foreign language, just reinforced that idea that it was a foreign religion with foreign ways of doing things and foreign ways of thinking. And when somebody who was uh, 
proud to call himself a member of that faith, ran for the highest office in the land, it surfaced many questions, legitimate questions, about the role of Catholicism in society. Now, it wasn't just prejudice that caused those kinds of concerns, because the fact of the matter is, until the mid-1960s, when the Catholic Church worldwide entered into what is called the Second Vatican Council, it's one of 20 councils throughout the history of the church that have been, that have radically um, defined the nature and mission of the church for its time period. Before that Second Vatican Council in the mid-1960s, the Catholic Church, as a body, as an international body, did not really believe in freedom of religion. Now we're champions of freedom of religion throughout the world, but universally, the church did not believe in freedom of religion. Our church had a long experience of Christendom, where Christianity was the dominant form of religion in Europe, in the known world at that time, and there was a strong belief that if we are right, why should somebody who's wrong have any say-so? Most of Europe's history has to do with the religion being the, the religion of the king or the prince or the leader, not so much a matter of individual choice. However, by the time of the Second Vatican Council, Catholics in the United States had about 200 years experience of being a church where people had to choose to belong and being a church that was not supported by the state a church whose income and whose ability to do ministry depended entirely on the generosity of its members who were freely chosen. In many countries of Europe, the church is still supported. Churches are still supported by tax dollars. People decide when they pay their taxes, they mark off on their forms where those tax dollars are going to. And there are many countries in the world that still have state religions. One of the founding ideas in the United States was we would not have such a thing. 13 colonies broke away from England. The Church of England is the Church of England. And the monarch, now the queen, is the head of the church, ranking even above their highest bishop. The United States was set up with the idea that the state would not have its own form of religion, would not sponsor any church, but also would not interfere with the free exercise of religion. And that has been a tough balance to maintain throughout our history. And very often you hear arguments that emphasize one side of that or another. The church has no business in this, religion has no business in this, uh, faith has no role to play in this discussion. Well, what our Constitution says is that the state, the government, will not establish a church, but it will also not interfere with people in the actual practice of their religion. So it's no favoritism, it's supposed to be an even playing ground, but it doesn't say that the church has nothing, the church is, have nothing to contribute to society. Quite the opposite. Well, at that Second Vatican Council in the 1960s, there was a Jesuit Catholic priest from the United States named John Courtney Murray, who argued at the Second Vatican Council that the U.S. was right. From that time, Rome considered the U.S. as the American experiment, and the odds were still out about whether it was going to work or not. But John Courtney Murray made a convincing case to the universal church that it actually works better when people choose their religion and don't go by force. It actually works better when people decide how much they are going to support their church and its works. It actually works better when people are not compelled to participate or belong to a particular church. His way of thinking actually carried the day and the church transformed from the mid-60s to being a voice for religious freedom throughout the world. Catholics are not the only religious body in the United States that argue that the separation clause, meaning that church and state should be separate according to our Constitution, we argue that the separation clause does not exclude the church from the public sphere, only that the church is not able to impose its views and its teachings, but it shouldn't be excluded from public discussion. Separation prohibits both state support and state suppression of religious expression. 
We saw that tested and really carried out, not only in the 1960 election when John F. Kennedy was elected, but then again in the 1980s when something called a group called the Moral Majority and the Christian right rose in prominence. Religious bodies seek to bring their commitment to the common good, rooted in their concepts of morality, to the democratic process by sharing their developed theories of moral law, their experience of direct service to the poor and marginalized, and the commitment of their membership who are engaged in the political process. So again, the idea is not that the church imposes its teaching, but it draws on a long moral teaching that it can coherently argue in the public sphere. It draws on lots of experience of being with the people most affected, and it draws on members who are politically engaged in more than one political party. Individual churches or religions can't impose their beliefs or their moral codes in a pluralistic society, and our respect for religious freedom acknowledges that, but their voices can add to the debate, and their witness contributes to the common good. So from our Catholic perspective, our Catholic engagement in the political sphere is determined and guided by a desire to promote the common good. When we try to teach on a controversial issue, when we try to teach on an issue that is divisive in the country or in society, we're trying to look at what is best for the society as a whole. When we're arguing in the public sphere, our first thing is not what is God telling you to do, but what is best for the common sphere. At the same time, what motivates us to get involved in the argument in the first place is our belief in what God is instructing us and our belief in what is right and what is wrong. But the importance of arguing that and showing how our beliefs and our teachings are based not only in scripture and tradition, but in human experience and how they relate to the common good. It is never the intention of our Catholic Church, despite some accusations to the contrary, it's never our intention to impose the precepts of the church. We don't impose any kind of religious participation. We don't impose that people attend church. We don't impose that people participate in the sacramental rites of the church. Our participation in religion, our participation in the public sphere is not just in the religious realm, but that which affects the flourishing well-being and the actual right to life of human beings. And so we believe that we have to bring to the discussion a carefully reasoned and coherent morality that is evident to human reason, not just dependent upon divine revelation. For legitimate engagement in the public sphere, churches should recognize the reality of religious pluralism. Not just our church, but all churches recognize there's a variety of perspectives on the religious question at work in our society. We respect the individual's freedom of choice when it comes to religion. We recognize that government is inherently secular and needs to be secular, not imposing a religion, and that religion and public policy is inherently complex. We acknowledge that civil law in itself is not designed to include all forms of morality. All morality cannot be legislated. And the relevance to the public good must be discerned and must be debated in public. Issues that motivate the church's engagement come from faith. We don't have any reason to get into politics for politics' own sake, except for our belief in what it is to live our faith in public. Our faith is not confined to the, the building of the church. Our faith is not confined to things that only relate to the world beyond this one. But our faith, <coughs> as part of the Judeo-Christian tradition, believes that our lives in this world are a manifestation of our beliefs. And we're here for a purpose, to serve the greater community. And how we live our lives in this world affects how we will live for eternity. So we're motivated by issues that come from our faith, but we engage publicly in issues that are not exclusively about our faith. We don't go to the courts, we don't go to the legislature and talk about how the Virgin Mary should be venerated. 
We don't go to the courts or to the legislature and argue about how many sacraments should be recognized in the church. Those things are a religious sphere. But when it comes to war and peace, when it comes to the protection of innocent life, when it comes to immigrants and refugees, when it comes to capital punishment, when it comes to issues of the preservation of creation, those things are, we have teachings about in our faith that we can also rationally argue in the public sphere. In 1983, as I said, Cardinal Bernadine, um, 10 years after the Roe versus Wade discussion, at a time when the threat of nuclear destruction was widely felt, did not seek to make rosary rallies and peace marches mandatory or government practices, but he called for a forum in which the Catholic moral vision might contribute to engaging the American culture for its own well-being in a discussion about what is right and wrong, how much of our resources should be put into the buildup of nuclear weapons, and what are the consequences of these choices. So it was at that time when he developed what he called a consistent ethic of life in the face of multiple threats to the sacredness of life, abortion and nuclear war being prominent examples. What could the sharing of the church's 2,000-year moral tradition offer to society? One important aspect was helping to define the key questions. How do we do good and avoid evil with new possibilities in law and technology and dangerous technology available to us? Who asks the moral questions if the church's voice is not in the public debate? With advances in technology, new moral problems are introduced. <coughs> when we can do almost anything, how do we decide what we ought to do and what we should never do? For many individual citizens of the country, their religious tradition plays a role in how we make personal choices. In public society, the collective religious sensibilities have something to contribute to that division, to that decision-making process about doing good and avoiding evil. Our moral tradition can address those issues on a spectrum from womb to tomb, so the seamless garment approach to the issues of the sacredness of life are described in Catholic language as from womb to tomb, meaning the whole spectrum of an individual's human life, and they are consistently rooted in the dignity of the human person. And when you take a stance about the sacredness of all human life and the dignity of all human beings, that involves policy about genetics. It involves policy about abortion, clearly. It involves policy about capital punishment. It involves policy about warfare. It involves policy about the terminally ill and the care of the terminally ill and whether people should be able to elect their, to die when they want to die. And there are many more issues that come into this field. Catholic sources for morality and really Catholic sources for all theology, faith-seeking understanding, are from the scriptures and our tradition. We recognize that tradition, that scripture itself comes out of tradition, and that tradition builds and accumulates through the years as its core aspects are handed down from generation to generation and expanded upon by the experience of people of faith seeking to discern God's will and the right course based on their scriptures as normative teaching. How to bring that to the public sphere. The idea that, sacred, that human life is sacred describes what is a religious value. It's one that is found in sacred scripture from the first chapter of the first book of the Bible and it also leads believers to accept a responsibility to protect and promote that sanctity. But even without the source of the book of Genesis as a teaching about humanity being the summit of all creation and teaching that each human being is made in the image and likeness of God, that is our foundation, that is the source of that belief. But even without the book of Genesis, we can argue in a pluralistic forum and that there is a societal good in restricting the destruction of human life. You don't have to be a believer to believe thou shalt not kill is a good law. You don't have to be a believer to recognize that if I want the right to life, 
if I want my humanity recognized as dignified, then I need to respect that towards other human beings. We learn early on that human life is both sacred and social. We're all interconnected. We begin life in families. We depend upon society for our support to be sustained. We depend on the interconnection of other human beings. We have a basic understanding that it is good to protect human life. How much more does the, the theological significance of the dignity of a human person add to our motivation and need to work for the protection and the flourishing of human life? To believe as Christians do that each human life has a transcendent value, not just limited to this world, but a transcendent value, makes a moral claim on the believer. The believer can simultaneously argue that the taking of human life, especially innocent human life, is damaging to the common good. Even if our moral theory has found practical justifications for the occasional taking of human life under certain circumstances, primarily in defense, we've also stood for uh, the taking of life not as a good in itself, but as justifiable in the recovery of property and in punishment, primarily in war. But that teaching itself has evolved to the time by the 20th century we had limited the justification simply to the defense of innocence. When applied to the question of abortion, the Catholic teaching is quite straightforward. The fetus is a human being. Sonograms make that clearer and clearer to many people. The fetus can never be an aggressor. Attacks on human non-aggressors are always wrong, even in war, and especially innocent life in the room. At the same time, we have to recognize that there are debatable aspects of this teaching in a pluralistic society. From a non-faith perspective, the issue of the humanity of the fetus may be questioned. There may be questions about at what precise moment does the fetus become human. Even from a faith perspective, people question when does the fetus receive a soul? When is it identifiable as a person? The other important question is where do the rights of the woman or the mother begin and end? We realize that those things have to be debated in the public sphere, even though our conclusion is clear and we will argue for that. The same Cardinal Bernadine who promotes the seamless garment says that those who defend the right to life of the weakest among us must be equally visible in support of the quality of life of the powerless among us the old and the young, the hungry and the homeless, the undocumented immigrant and the unemployed worker. It's not enough, as we recognize, to advocate for changes in abortion law if you're not willing to support those in crisis pregnancy, if you're not willing to provide adequate means for people to deliver uh, babies, make sure that they can do so in a healthy way. It's problematic in a country where the infant mortality rate is increasing because of limited access to health care. Those are life issues that have to be addressed. Pro-life has to be broader than pro-birth. There are policy implications beyond the prohibition of abortion for those who believe in the sanctity of human life and that its preservation promotes the common good. Proposing this consistent approach to life issues, the Cardinal recognized that every person cannot be fully engaged in every life issue but it is important to cultivate a consensus around the explicit connections of the life issues. Defending a right to life necessarily involves defending a concern for the quality of life. Even while distinct issues require distinct moral analysis, they aren't identical. The sanctity of life and the dignity of the human person are the consistent moral principles that help us to address them. When we talk about the dignity of human life, we find that there are many related topics, even things that cross into other fields like pornography, sexual exploitation or objectification, sexism, the different treatment of men and women, racism, human rights, domestic and foreign. From the church's perspective and the perspective that the church brings to the public sphere, they are always focused on the dignity and the sanctity the human person. 
Similarly, the desire to use our common resources, our common good as government to reduce poverty and human misery is a societal responsibility, enhanced, but not only found by the scripture's preferential option for the poor. Access to health care is necessary for the flourishing of human life. How do we determine what is public versus private morality? Our answer from scripture and tradition is that it's public if it affects the public good. And because we are social beings, so much does affect the common good. The Roe versus Way decision was based on a right to privacy. Our approach would be that taking the innocent human life is a public matter. It's, is this what we want to be as a society? The question of why the church is interested at all in social issues comes from that long based tradition, starting with the Jewish prophets, who called attention to injustice, who called for repentance of those who were exploiting the vulnerable and the weak. It was enhanced by the witness of Jesus, who in our tradition, believe is the fullness of God made present in our world, and it was enhanced by the early church who strove to live by the teachings and example of Jesus, not just defending but also working for the well-being of common good. In the, sec in the Second Vatican Council, as I said in the mid-1960s, the documents that helped the church to understand its place in the world called for not only an internal ordering of the church, but also a reflection on what the church should be in the world. And the document that teaches that for Catholics is called Gaudium et Spes, Latin words which means joy and hope. And the document begins by saying the joys and hopes of humanity, as well as the struggles and pains of humanity, are the joys and hopes of the church, the struggles and pains of the church. Everything that affects human beings because we are made in the image and likeness of God is within the realm of the church to teach. The church is a voice to contribute, not to dominate, but to contribute in the public sphere. Now fast forward to our present moment, ever since 2013, when the Catholic Church has been led by Pope Francis, who comes from a different experience than the vast majority of his predecessors, the first pope from Latin America, the first pope from what we often consider the developing world, who joked when he stepped out for the first time as pope and said they've gone to the ends of the earth to find the pope. The ends of the earth because he comes from the southern hemisphere, from Argentina. From the beginning of his papacy, Pope Francis has always looked towards the peripheries and to the margins. And he's called the church to its own kind of conversion to be more attentive to those who are farthest from the center of power instead of the other way around tells us that our moral compass should be set by those who are suffering the most. And that helps us determine how to best be human and how to best be followers of Christ, who emptied himself of power and authority and assumed the lowliness of human flesh. Pope Francis clearly and repeatedly includes the unborn in his descriptions of the marginalized, but he sees the lack of reverence for human life he sees the lack of reverence for life in the womb as the consequence of a consumerist and materialist, cult, materialist culture that has come to consider human beings to be just as disposable as our outdated products. It doesn't work for us, we can get rid of it. The same attitude that would prevent aborting a child allows, excuse me, the same attitude that would permit aborting a child allows for the careless indifference to the elderly, to the handicapped, and even the disposal of the terminally ill. He's decried in many of his teachings what he calls the globalization of indifference, which allows the powerful to ignore the suffering and deaths of the poor, even when this regularly uh, occurs on a massive scale. Challenging the church in the United States, in particular, that has taken a strong stand on the abortion issue, but doesn't always teach convincingly the interconnectedness of all the issues. Pope Francis said, our defense of the innocent unborn needs to be clear, firm, and passionate, for at stake is the dignity of human life, which is always sacred and demands love for each person, regardless of his or her stage of development. Equally sacred, however, 
are the lives of the poor, those already born, the destitute, the abandoned, and the underprivileged, the vulnerable infirm, and the elderly exposed to covert euthanasia, the victims of human trafficking, new forms of slavery, and every form of rejection. So even within the body of the Catholic Church, there's a call for conversion to a deeper understanding of the broad implications of what a stance about the dignity and sanctity and reverence for human life implies. And then Pope Francis has broadened our understanding of the context of life issues by pointing to the delicate circumstances of the planet itself, the care for creation. If we don't care about preserving the planet itself that sustains our life, it's hard to make a claim that we're concerned about the sanctity and the dignity of each human person. The Pope insists that the dignity of the human person who is given by God dominion over creation paired with responsibility is asserted in the scriptures and he offers a critique of our tendency to diminish human responsibility for the care of others and the care of the elements of creation. When we fail to acknowledge as part of reality the worth of a poor person, the worth of a human embryo, the worth of a person with disabilities, to offer just a few examples, it then becomes difficult to hear the cry of nature itself. Everything is connected. I think in his universal view of interconnectedness of all things and the primacy primary concern about the dignity of human nature, there is a key that unifies all of the issues with which we are concerned in the public sphere. I hope I've made it clear that the church doesn't think it's its role to assert or impose its beliefs, but can't be excluded from the public argument and brings a lot to that table from its network of witness throughout the country, from its 2,000 years history of dealing with these issues, from the clarity of a moral framework in a philosophical tradition that is able to expound it, and from its commitment to the sanctity and dignity of the human person. I think we have time for some questions. Yes, thank you very much. Any questions that you might have? Well, Bishop, I have one question. You've given us a grand argument about this pro-life philosophy and worldview. As you look at all the issues, abortion, immigration, creation, care, war and peace, right now, the church had to pick one issue. What would you say is the most pressing issue for this country right now? Well, I think that's a trap that we don't want to get into. <laughs> and there are many voices in the church that would say, well, it starts with the right to be born. Right? So there are many prominent voices in our church that would argue that that is the singular issue on which all the others depend. And there's a certain logic to that point, for sure. But I think Pope Francis is really insistent on teaching us that it's all interconnected, because if you can justify the destruction of one type of human life, it's very easy to, to expand that and justify others. So where do we put our emphasis? Um, that's, a that's a tough ta challenge for us. And our church has been consistent in its uh, opposition to abortion from the beginning, and that's not going to go away. But when we have a situation where no party represents that fullness of life approach, and where you have to choose between two political parties, one that is strongly, at least verbally, in favor of the right to life at birth, but not so good about the support systems and the care of the environment and immigration and care of the poor, all those other things, it's very difficult. So that's where we find ourselves having to discern. And when the U.S. bishops issue an, uh, a letter every four years before uh, an election, it says we don't tell people how to vote. What we try to do is form consciences so that people can make the best choice they can with limited, with, uh, limited options because there's no perfect or ideal So it's kind of dancing around your question, but we can't really say that one thing because when you, you make one choice, you're ruling out all the other things that are very connected to it. And if our commitment to pro-life at birth also depends on having the circumstances in which the poor 
and the vulnerable can bring children into society where they're cared for and have the resources to do so becomes uh, a difficult question for them. Absolutely. Any other questions? Well, we want to give you a gift. We want to thank you for being with us. We want to give you a gift. And I don't know if bishops are allowed to wear t-shirts. Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, yes. We hope so. I couldn't find a, a bishop hat or anything at the bookstore. So anyways, we, we thank you so much for being with us.